and then uh, we can start as we uh, would like this to go uh, and we are live now. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody and uh, thank you so much for your time here today. Uh, I am very, very pleased to have here a stage three, which is uh, the, the last of a series of stages that uh, have happening uh, throughout this uh, conversation, throughout this uh, day, uh, the solstice day, uh, winter solstice for the Northern Hemisphere and uh, um, summer solstice for the, the colleagues that are living in the South Hemisphere. And uh, so this is uh, stage three, I'm really excited. It was a long, long day, but obviously not for Fernando and Elise Keith, which are our guest speakers uh, for them, it's the morning. Uh, the early break of the day, so it's amazing to see how the world has become a global village and we can have conversations that endure all, all across the planet. Uh, uh, without uh, further ado, I will start the session, uh, obviously thank, uh, thanking the participation of all the in-room participants. You are going to be an, a, a fundamental piece of uh, our uh, learning uh, today our shared learning, because uh, I hope that you can uh, participate in the debate and the discussion that will follow the presentations from Elise and from Fernando. So uh, I, I will um, uh, would like each guest speaker to introduce themselves. And uh, the first one will be uh, 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 Levan from Barco, which unfortunately he cannot make it. Initially he thought he could, but uh, then he, he, he couldn't for, for personal reasons. But I have here a video of his presentation that I would like to share with you all now. So my proposal is that we watch um, uh, uh, Levin's video and then we'll follow up uh, with, uh, with um, the, the planned uh, uh, roster of uh, participation, which will be Elise and then last Fernando. Uh, they, they will have around 10 minutes or less or more if they like for talking. And then in the end, we'll do a, a conversation, we'll extend the conversation and we'll end the session whenever you like. Hopefully not more than 90 minutes, which is the time, the time that we have scheduled for today. And uh, uh, without further ado, so uh, I will start um, my share my screen with the presentation from uh, Livia. And hopefully you can hear it. Uh, it's, uh, and he will pose some questions that I would hope then that Elise would take those questions into our presentation and then uh, Fernando also as well. So uh, let's let's bear with uh, me for just one moment. And uh, are you seeing my screen sharing? Okay, so let's then start the video. Good morning, good afternoon. Hey Gary, hey Paul. Thank you very much for the invitation to join today. And my apologies, I could not join live. Unfortunately, I uh, already had planned some uh, some family time and would have been impossible to join. But since your topic, the future of digital collaboration is very close to, uh, to heart for me, I, uh, I hope you don't mind me uh, contributing uh, from a remote or uh, via a video uh, message. First of all, uh, I'm uh, Lieven Bertier. I'm uh, heading up the segment marketing team for Workplace at Barco. And the reason why uh, collaboration is so important to me is because when we talk workplace, collaboration is for a lot of people their number one competitive asset. Within Barco, we run a future of meeting rooms research. We've been doing that since 2013, and uh, we also ran one uh, early September uh, with a lot of people. And of course, that was the first time we were ready to measure the impact of the pandemic, the new normal. Some people call it, some people call it the area, uh, the, the the era. I have to say, of blended meetings, of virtual meetings, of hybrid meetings. Well, it was the first time we were able to uh, to measure this, and there were five key findings. Uh, from our side. First of all, we know that work from home got accepted. It's getting mainstream and all of us say typically we will be continuing to work two, three, two to three days uh, from home post pandemic. Second thing, already used to work hybrid. Hybrid meetings. Meetings are by definition hybrid going forward. That means there's going to be a mix of in-room and a mix of remote participants in any meeting, in any call. Next to that, what we also found is that the huddle attitude, the, 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 the unplanned ad hoc meeting uh, culture that was growing has come to a standstill. This could be temporary. This could also be more longer term, still to be found out. But fact is we have a preference now again for planned structured meetings. Number four is when it comes to uh, 
technology. It's all about usability, key finding. And last but not least, something we already picked up back in 2019, there is a clear preference with people to host calls from their laptop. So instead of using dedicated room equipment, instead of using uh, so-called video room systems, people have a preference to do this from their laptop. Now, that's what we found in our survey. But this, this is about dialogue. This is about conversation today. So what I would like to do is fuel a bit of discussion uh, amongst you by bringing forward three uh, theses, I would say, three statements from my side, which uh, are things uh, to be reflected upon. And the first one I would like to bring in is we are missing out today on tomorrow's innovation. What do I mean with this? Uh, and the question is, are we missing out on the next big innovation because of us being confined, because of us working from home, because of us not being physically together? And the reason I'm making this statement is a bit of research that uh, Stanford economist Nicholas Bloom did. Uh, he did a work from home experiment back in 2015. And long story short, he found out that people uh, after the initial productivity, <coughs> sorry, uh, that people after the initial productivity increase uh, by starting to work from home, after a while they uh, are missing out. They are missing out on news, they are missing out on social connection, they are missing out on promotion. And long story short, uh, that led Nick Bloom to say this year, the research was done in 2015, by the way, but he said this year uh, during the first lockdown that his big worry is we are missing out on today, on, on, on tomorrow's big innovation while we're all in lockdown, all of us working from home. So that's my first question I would like to throw in for discussion. Second question, second statement I would like to throw in is, um, because of the pandemic, because of the new normal, because of the hybrid meetings that we have now, working from home has gotten mainstream. That's clear. Well, here's my statement. Now that work from home is mainstream, any remote participant will be heard equally, will be participating in the same equally strong way in a meeting as those in the room. So do we have this new balance? Do we have this new equilibrium in meetings? That is my second statement, my second question for today. And my third question would be related to one of the patterns you also picked up in survey. And that is my personal conviction, by the way. Experience, user experience will be the number one differentiator for technology in the new normal. It's not about what your technology can do in terms of functionality or what kind of technical specifications a technology has. It's all about the UX. UX will rule in the next decade. So that's my three statements. Uh, I hope uh, it will make for engaged discussions. And I promise from my side, next time I'll make sure to join you live. Um, so, once again, the three questions. Are we missing out on the next big innovation? Are people who work from home equally well, equally strong heard in meetings? And is experience, is UX the number one differentiator for technology going forward? Thank you very much. Happy brainstorming and have a great 2021. I hope that the sound reached you well, uh, and uh, that's uh, at least uh, you could take on some of these questions, if not all, on your uh, presentation. And uh, definitely, I think the third one could be also important for you. It could. That is not at all what I'm prepared to talk about, even a little bit, but I will happily uh, embrace those questions with glee when uh, we get to the conversation part. For sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. All so you do this thing and you can move yourself back and forth and you get unfuzzy. What I actually am super excited to talk about is meeting flow modeling. So can I do that? Sure, definitely. Let's go ahead. All right. So, um, and uh, I think that I do think that what he shared is, is interesting, not terribly surprising, uh, but great conversational fodder. But I want to talk about something that we don't talk about in the facilitation community very often at all, which is this idea of designing meetings outside of the, the main workshop session. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen. I have a little presentation for you. 
And I am going to desperately try to keep this to 10 minutes. This is not something I've talked about a don't, lot. Don't in, worry, don't worry, Louise. We are in relaxed. these kinds of groups. Um, can you make it possible for me to share my screen? Uh, uh, definitely. I will forgot to make you co-host as well as Fernando, and uh, you will both, both, both be co-hosts the session. And oh, there we go. Excellent. All right. So you should be seeing a huge slide about introduction to meeting flow modeling. Does everybody see that? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so meeting flow modeling is um, this idea about how you string meetings together. And it is based in our belief that meetings are where the action is. And to start connecting with this concept, um, I think, we, you know, let's just talk about a couple of folks in business. Uh, you have a, we have this belief in our business world, I am in heroes, in hero leaders, in the people with the fabulous idea. So uh, let's just take a hypothetical story about two people who have a fabulous idea. And in fact, my little green person on the left has an even better idea than the, the bland little white person on the right. It is fabulous idea for a new product. So these individuals with these fabulous ideas start thinking about their fabulous idea and how they can bring that fabulous idea to market. And the person on the left goes off into their cave and becomes geniusy brilliant, continues to develop that idea. But the person on the right uh, says, you know what, I've got this idea, but to get any product to market, I think I'm going to need some money. So they begin talking to the finance folks and they get the piggy bank. And with the piggy bank, full of cash, they then start to talk to some implementers and they build a team and they start building and they start testing things. And as they're testing their idea, they realize that once they've got it kind of built together, they're gonna to have to get it out to the places where people can use it. So they start talking to the supply chain. They talk to the people who have the, all of the access to the raw materials and who can do the shipping and who can do the distribution. And with themselves all lined up for a fabulous holiday, they get involved with the press. Do you see the amazing things that we are building? We are bringing it right there to you. And when it hits the press, people go wild. They start talking to the stores. And then, you know, it's a happy Christmas, right? They bring their product out to the world. Whereas on the other side, our friend with the even better idea, similar but better idea, is now got that idea just perfect realizes the entire conversational chain has already been locked up and their brilliant idea goes nowhere. So in this situation, the meetings, the idea is great, but the meetings are the thing that bring the idea out into the world and into life. And as facilitators, we, are, we already know this. We know that each and every one of those meetings can be designed. And in fact, one of the things that most of us do very well, either in a digital world or a physical world, is we design great meetings, right? So um, you may recognize this is a variation on, you know, Sam Kaner's uh, diamond of participatory decision making, or what we call it is the double-headed pencil, right? The shape of an effective meeting um, that uh, Dave Gray put together is that you bring the group together, you help them understand what you're, what you're doing, you focus that conversation, then you do the work of the meeting or the workshop, and then you wrap it up at the end, making sure everybody's got decisions clarity and action item clarity and whatever it is that you need to take out from that result. And as we move into COVID, one of the things in the digital world, in the online world that we have to do with those one day workshops is break them apart, right? Like putting people for eight hours straight into an online session is really hard. I, Paul, how's your time been today? It's kind of exhausting, isn't it? It is, it is, <laughs> it's really right, yeah, <laughs> I can admit. So even if you do a, a big uh, solstice party marathon like this, you're still breaking it up. You're still taking hours in between them, which sure. means you get all kinds of pencils going together. You chain it together. So that, that at a basic level, is a flow, right? You have uh, one meeting, one session leading into another. So we know how to do this with workshops. We do it with our strategic planning workshops, with our team building workshops, with those kinds of things. Now at, at Lucid, our focus is the everyday business meeting. And what we have found is that workshops are just one 
of you know basically 16 distinct types of meetings that need to happen for our people with the fabulous idea to go ahead and bring all of those ideas out into the world. And the key opportunity here is when you design not just the workshops, but you design the rest of the conversations as well. So let me talk about how that might play out in a business setting. This is a really um, typical kind of what we call meeting flow model the leadership teams use when they work with a high end business coach in a growth situation. So these are um, your startup companies. These are your companies that are adding people uh, quickly and are working with a business coach to make sure that they're the strategies that they're coming up with in the fabulous workshop once a year, twice a year, actually get put into practice. So they design that workshop for sure. No question. But then they also have a strong design for their daily huddle. So it's not an ad hoc huddle. It's a well scripted huddle, very much like an agile stand up. We talk about these things every day, 10 minutes, first thing in the morning. That meeting is what they use to make sure they're on track and they're connected with as things change around them. Then once per week, they meet for 90 minutes. And in that 90 minute meeting, they talk about anything that's going on for them tactically, any roadblocks. And then they also check how are we doing on our progress towards the goals we laid out in our strategic plan. So their strategic plan never becomes, um, golly, I heard a number of facilitators say this, they called it um, shelf poop, only, only it rhymed better, right? You do the big strategic plan and then you, you put it up on the shelf and nobody ever looks at it again. This is not what happens in these groups. They look at it every week and they say, okay, we're checking off these, these things, we're making progress. Now, we all know every plan um, is about <laughs> worth about as much as, uh, uh, you know, you're going to hand to 2020 and let 2020 have its way with it, right? So uh, they know their plan's not going to have everything in it. They know things are going to come up, either good opportunities or catastrophes that require them to make a big decision. And they also know that effective decision making is not something where you just say, hey, guys, what do you think? Let's go you actually have a process for running effective decision-making. So they set aside time on their calendar every month to make sure they can run through an effective decision-making meeting. And then finally, to keep their plan, their strategy in line with the changing nature of reality, they do a refresh every 90 days. So with a flow like this, with every one of these meetings designed, that team knows what their plan is, what they're doing every day, how they're operating on plans, and how they'll get together to make decisions to change that plan. And teams that run this way work faster, work more successfully, and eliminate a lot of wasted time in unproductive meetings. So this is a pretty typical leadership team meeting flow model. And um, just to you know, sort of anchor back in terms of what a meeting flow model is, so it's basically process documentation, right? It highlights the main meetings you use to achieve a business result. So when we as facilitators design a workshop, that's one meeting in that larger model. And I can, I'll share these with you later if you want them. So let's look at one that's maybe a little bit nearer and dearer to our hearts as uh, our own business leaders for our own independent practice. So these are some example meetings you might run in your sales process. So when you are going to work with a new client about potentially doing some consulting work or some uh, facilitation work for them, this set suite of meetings are the meetings that you can run that help you make sure that you're doing the work well and you get to revenue quickly. So to begin with, somebody gives you a call and you run basically what's called a, a red velvet rope, right? A qualification call. Now, if you know, and you have written down, these are the questions I ask, this is the way I lead this conversation to make sure they're a good fit, you can make that call a 10 minute call, not a 30 minute call. And when you get even better at it, you can make that call lead right into proposal. But sometimes, sometimes you get a call from somebody, they don't know what you want, what you're doing, right? They, uh, they, they have a problem, they think maybe you can help, 
Well, then you're going to route them into a couple of calls where you make sure they understand what you do, give them a briefing, and then make sure you understand what they do, where you dive into their needs, you do needs discovery. But whatever you're doing as you go this, when you get to the point where you're ready to put a proposal in front of them, we have found and many others have found that if you Get, schedule that call, that proposal meeting call, where you are writing that proposal with them, you're co-creating it. You can, on that call, talk to them about exactly what's in the proposal, what's not, all of the logistics information, all of the budget information, payment terms, cancellation terms, and then all of these things, intellectual property, non-disclosure, will it be recorded, are they going to be able to reuse your content, and every time you run one of these calls, you learn a little bit more about the kinds of things that come up when they talk to procurement, when they take your proposal to their boss, when they um, take it to the committee and the committee has to make a decision. And you write that proposal template, you plan that meeting, you write your design for how you run that meeting so that you can answer those questions right there and then the next time you are in a call like that, you take that proposal and you walk your champion through it and they walk out knowing 100% that that's gonna get signed because they were there and they looked at all of those details with you and said, yes, indeed, this is what I can do. So this is a, a fairly typical um, consulting level sales process. And when you design each one of those meetings, script those out, then you get to accelerate how you operate that way too. So what do you get when you design meeting flow models? Um, first, you get better meetings, right? So when we are designing not just the workshops, but the replans and how we run our sales conversations and all of the others, we get better meetings because, you know, obviously if you design the call to get the result, you're more likely to get it. It's less stressful and you get demonstrable return on investment. So um, when we do this work with clients, you can do get measurable uh, money back on ter in terms of productivity, sales, um, or if you're working with nonprofits or aid organizations, reach and impact, and then employee engagement and retention. So those are all pretty, pretty exciting sort of bottom line results when you do this work. Um, the other thing you get when you have those meetings designed out is you have a mechanism for driving culture change. So when you are working with a client who is saying, you know, hey, I want to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in my business, the, um, one of the things you can do when you have meetings scheduled and designed is you can say, okay, well, you know what, on our weekly team meeting, we're going to rotate who leads that call making sure that everybody gets an equal opportunity to be included. Everybody has an equal opportunity to drive. Um, and you have a practical mechanism for building that value into the company. Uh, and finally, you get a competitive advantage because by and large, most leaders don't realize that this is part of their job. Just like my sad little friend didn't. And when you do, you win. So that is my pitch on meeting flow modeling. I'm super, super excited to hear all your questions later. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Elise. This was really a round of applause <laughs> from the participants. It's always good to see uh, uh, a human uh, touch here. Okay, so uh, let's um, all your questions for Elise in just a minute. So we'll uh, listen now from Fernando. Also, don't forget the challenge uh, from uh, Levin in the start of this presentation. Uh, I would like also to welcome the participants that in the meantime get on board Zoom and thank you for being so silent and quiet while Elise was uh, presenting. Thank you so much, all participants. It's good to have you here. We have a very good group for discussion and learning. Fernando, Murray, over to you. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Oh, I'm big here. Just acknowledging that Cadu Lemos is in the room. He's a very dear friend from Brazil. And I think he's responsible for a big part of my self-development. So it's nice to see him here. Anyway, I would just share, I think, two slides. And before I do this, just a little bit of context. 
I'm Brazilian, but I'm living in, in Canada for seven years now. And I have been working with virtual facilitation for, for a while, for almost five years, trying to keep up with the business in Brazil and, and all over the place. And since 2019, we start offering virtual facilitation workshops to help people go into this strange world of flat screens and make it, make it alive. And it's been a, a fun journey. Of course, in March, we had a boost in our business, but it's been a, a very a steep learning curve for everyone, inclusive in our, our team is in this learning curve as well. So what I, when I saw the question, what will I bring to the world? Maybe one thing that stood out for me during this last year was uh, that people are not too much looking for methods and, and tools and all this, uh, hardware stuff about technology, but more about how can I do this in this different media? So how can I transform myself in this process? So what I'll be uh, showing here, it's more about our inner work and it's so sit. So it's, uh, it's a good time of the year to, instead of looking outside, is to look inside as facilitators and, and, and check what it can, we can transform. So I will share the slides. Can you see the slides? Yeah. So what is this? What is this, Paul, that you are seeing on your screen? A cube. A cube, yeah. 90% of people answer, this is a cube. 10% are multitasking, so they don't answer. <laughs> so and actually, this uh, process of seeing something that is flat and, and answering about something that is three-dimensional because a cube has form, right? It has a shape. It belongs to the human world. But what we are seeing on the screen is a flat drawing of something that we extrapolate to a cube. That's amazing in itself. And that's one thing that we, we can point for people to pay attention. We can make things on this flat screen way more alive than they are. They are. So that's amazing. So, but, but this is an exercise from Alan Kaplan from the Proteus Initiative in South Africa. And if you can get one thing from this presentation is this exercise, you can do it with a lot of groups and we always get amazing, amazing results. So what is the exercise? You can see a cube easily, right? Now try to see the other cube mm -hmm. because there is a second cube in this image. Yeah. It's a different perspective. One, one up from one down. Can you see it? And yep. if you can see it on this other perspective, try to come back to the first perspective and go back and forth for some seconds. <laughs> what did I used to do? Ah, yes, I got it now, Fernando. Yeah, it's two, I, I can see the two perspectives. Yes, one yeah, from yeah. the bottom and one from the yeah, Exactly, one face I had is this one and the other one is like this. There are many studies about what wow. you see depending on your perspective. That doesn't matter. You, can you see two cubes now? I because can. that's the amazing part. Nothing changed outside. What changed, it was inside you. Your perception changed and yeah. you can see different things. So I think this is the link for virtual facilitation because we have been doing this for a long time, right? I have been on this road for many years and I have been doing things in one way and it's very easy to see in one way. It's comfortable. And when this virtual facilitation came up, things changed, but you can, you can look outside, you can look for the tools, you can look for the methods. We can look outside a lot, but sometimes it's hard to look inside and see what changed inside myself to do this properly. So this is the, the thing that I want to bring you to reflect upon. And going back in my early career, I was an instructor at Altor Bound. And for me, this is the basic facilitation. It's the most raw style of facilitation because you have a group of people willing to go into a journey. They have the equipment, but we never know what will happen. So this is totally human and beautiful and unpredictable. And that's lovely because you can be prepared, but you never know if you're prepared enough because you don't know what will happen. So one thing that we learned during the instructor's course and through practice is to create autonomy in groups. 
because it's fundamental to create autonomy. It's actually a part of the process. It's to become a safer group, to manage risk properly. You have to create autonomy from day one, from moment zero. If they don't take care about their feet, for example, if anyone has a problem in, their, in one foot, everyone will be stuck with that person in the journey. So everyone needs to be responsible for a lot of things, not just us as instructors or just someone else. Everyone is responsible. So doing this translation for facilitation, how many times do we create autonomy in groups? How many times do we let people facilitate themselves? Usually what we do is uh, bring a lot of responsibility for us and do a lot of work. And sometimes people don't do the work because we're doing the work for them. So that's another uh, topic to, to consider. And this other side is em embrace and predictability. It's uh, obvious in, the, in this context of the wilderness, but it's also common in, in organizations, in any kind of uh, human groups. How many times we plan something and we, when we are there, things change? So it will change. It will be unpredictable anyway. No matter how much we plan, things will be unpredictable. And that's, uh, there is a, a very interesting link between creating autonomy and embracing predictability because the more you create autonomy, the more unpredictable things are because people can do things, right? But the more autonomy they have, the easiest it is to embrace unpredictability because people are taking charge, people are taking responsibility as well. So there, there is a, a fun a game to play. And just to close, what about liberated instructors? So liberated instructors are uh, a nice collection of methods that help us to move from this one-to-many kind of communication to many-to-many. -many. That it's also unpredictable, right? It's more predictable to have one talking to many. Leaders love to talk for their uh, people, but what, what about people talking to people all the time and make this more alive? So liberated instructors help us to do this uh, in, a, in a beautiful way, combining one to many and many to many at the same time. That's something that happens when you use liberated instructors. And the most important part for me in liberated instructors are these principles. So if you, if you go through these principles and you check, am I facilitating with these principles in mind or in my heart? Sometimes I, I feel myself not including and unleashing everyone, for example. I think this is the hardest one. How can we include and unleash everyone all the time when we are facilitating? So I'm always uh, trying to look at this when I'm facilitating, when I'm planning things. And, and sometimes I, I feel that I don't uh, tick all the marks here. It's uh, an ongoing process. But one thing that I really try to pay attention that it's fundamental in my perspective is this number six, amplify freedom and responsibility. It's about creating autonomy for the groups to make them responsible for what is coming. And also this number 10, never start without a clear purpose. Sometimes I just checking if the, the purpose is clear is like 90% of my work. Sometimes it's just, that was just the, the job, just to get the purpose clear. So that's uh, a little bit of what I, I brought to share with you. Looking at our uh, role as facilitators, how can we make small changes inside ourselves that will change completely the way we work with groups and do a better work? Thank that you. was it. Thank you. Under Thank 10 you so minutes, much. right? <laughs> 10 minutes. A round of applause to Fernando for sharing. And, and wow, what an incredible uh, content that we have uh, so far. It's really, really amazing. I, I'm, I'm thrilled to have here in this group of participants a number of um, facilitators also that could be sharing uh, with us their comments and their inputs. So uh, uh, perhaps uh, Kadu Lemus uh, is uh, uh, someone that you acknowledge, Fernando. Kadu, would you like to contribute something after Fernando's presentation? And then I open up uh, the field um, to other participants and finally going back to Elise for uh, wrapping up on the observations. Kadu? 
Ah, uh, no, no. Okay, if Kadu is not able to join uh, the conversation because he's an on camera analyst. And by the way, this is an interesting challenge yes, that I would like to bring our two guest speakers uh, uh, because, in a certain way, Elise is uh, as a presentation on uh, meeting flow. That is, uh, when we were preparing this, she said, "Oh, but this is nothing to do with facilitation." And and it's interesting because what is really the common demonitate. Common ground between uh, Elise's presentation on meeting flow and Fernando's presentation, which is a presentation based on a facilitation methodology. I don't consider Fernando uh, a collection of methods, uh, liberating structures, that too humble. I think uh, liberating structures is uh, uh, by itself a, 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 a philosophy of how to apply these methods. So it, it, uh, it upgrades them as, or it as a um, uh, really a facilitation methodology, right? Liberating structure. But what is the common ground here as between these two things is something that uh, Martin and I wrote about it on the, on the Martin Duff, which a co-author also of the book here, wrote on the conclusion chapter of our book, Beyond Virtual Meetings, is that the, the notion of collaboration architect, right? So the collaboration architecture is what binds us all here together. Right? So there's a perspective on the facilitation there's a perspective on the meeting flow. And this is a challenge for you, Elise and Fernando, because sometimes because of the easy accessibility of the online meetings, uh, I, I got in my workshops participants that are walking the dogs. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, wow, why, why someone is walking a dog attending an online meeting uh, to conduct a workshop? You know, because it's easy to connect. It's easy to connect. So that's the challenge here, uh, Elise, in terms of meeting flow, would participants be able to join by mobile phone? And also for you, Fernando, your experiences on this kind of impromptu collaboration from mobile phones, people walking the dogs. Um, Elise, maybe you first and then Fernando. Well, the, I think, you know, Fernando totally hit it, right? It's all about that balance between um, autonomy and unpredictability. And when you use something like liberating structures, uh, people come in with a job to do, right? So it's much harder to walk the dog when you're meant to be doing your five whys or uh, contributing in some sort of, you know, context, critical uncertainties or doing something like that. And uh, meeting flow modeling is about, it's exactly the same kind of concept as using liberating structures, which are considered microstructures. The meeting flow model is the macrostructure. And in both cases, what you're doing is you're making clear what the rules of the game are and what the purpose and goals of the game are so that everybody can play, right? Because if people don't know what the meetings are for, how they're meant to run, when to run them, why to run them, it's all a mystery. Um, I, there was a great uh, study done by Cornerstone Training. This is a little bit tangential, but I think it's related. Um, and they were looking at what are the important things in terms of training budgets and technology and access for employees. And they found that um, companies that had a training budget, it wasn't so much the amount of money that they had in that budget that made the biggest difference. The biggest difference was that they told employees that there was one, right? So, <laughs> which many, many companies never did. And this is, this is kind of the point of both, you know, the autonomy uh, unleashed by both liberating structures and the meeting flows, right? tell people that they are in fact in charge and then they don't walk the dog, right? They, they know they have a thing to do. Uh, like, oh, I'm meant to contribute this. I can't do that with my thumbs in my poop bag. You know, maybe I'll sit at my laptop. Thank you, Elise. I think Charlotte wants to step in and then to you, Fernando, to compliment. Uh, Charlotte, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, and thank you for three uh, very, very interesting keynotes. Uh, uh, the first one on video, Elise and uh, Fernando's in the end. Very inspiring, very different, very inspiring, well put together, Paul. Thank you. Um, the, I'll, I'll start with the middle because we never start with the middle. Uh, one. Um, uh, Elise's uh, keynote you know, really resonated with me because I work in a team strategy and management in the, in the 
uh, municipality of Copenhagen in one of the units. And we have, we're a team of 12 con internal consultants and we have for one and a half year, we have been working on uh, uh, producing a, a structure like that. And we actually got the last bit approved in our leadership only a week ago. Uh, and that gives, uh, yeah, that was terrific. And the best Christmas present for anybody, uh, any of us, because now we can see what it is that we are going to deliver within the next year. And we have leveled expectations with our all our internal stakeholders on how will we progress from here? We don't know the content yet, but everybody has agreed on the process. And it's just the most tremendous relief for us. I mean, it just takes about 30% of our work out of our work. Because now people have, you know, they'll go into meetings with this recognition. Oh yeah, we agreed to have a meeting like this. And no, yeah, it's according to plan. Oh, that's terrific. You know, there's a this kind of um, recognition about it that is much, much to be preferred to have as a reception then, oh, why do we want this meeting? Or we had a meeting only a month ago and now we're doing it again. And I don't know why. And, and that's really to have a master plan like that is terrific. So thank you for that. I'm very interested to see your slide on difficult types of meeting. So I hope you can forward that, uh, the slide for your presentation. So um, our first, uh, our video, I, I've forgotten his name, I have to say, admit. Uh, Levan, Levan Bernier from Barco. One more time? Levan Bernier. Levan, yes. Yeah. I loved his, I uh, was very inspired by his three questions. And I think that my, my answer would be no, no, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can, uh, I can put the, I wrote, I quickly wrote down his questions because I love them so much. I put them in a chat and I'll, you can see my answers in it also. Uh, um, <clears throat> and I'll be happy to uh, you know, elaborate on it, but uh, I would love to hear what you think. If, if your yeses and noes are the same as mine. Um, and it, absolutely genius 10 principles in the end, Fernando. I didn't know I had been working accordingly to the liberating structures, the values for, for many years, but I'm like, Oh, terrific. And I was like, have you ever dug into anything uh, around political facilitation? Because I think you, if you did that, uh, you might discover that there are a lot of similarities there. If you did dig into specific, specifically around uh, facilitating political processes. Uh, I know there's a lot of Canadians that does very great things and we have a Danish lady called Sakia Elvang that does terrific things with citizen assemblies. Really groundbreaking work. You would love that. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Uh, over to you, Fernando, and anyone else would like to step in, please raise hand as I will see the list in the participants. And uh, over to you. Yeah, I was just... Uh... Combining the what you said about architecture, and Elise put very well the the framework and the microstructures. We can actually picture an image where we can easily see the the bigger arch, like the space that we'll be gathering, the framework, the method. Sometimes it's hard to look into these microstructures. How we'll be doing this? In the will be like in tables. Are they going to be seated? Are they going to be standing? All these microstructures make a difference, including here in the virtual space. So we can have like 50 rooms or 20 rooms. How will be people be sorted? And there is a third element that I think this is the underlining. How am I going to be in this space? So if you have this architecture planned, all laid out, how can I be there doing my best work? Should I be leading? Should I be following? Should I be coaching? So all these internal processes are also sometimes uh, uh, forgotten. And maybe because we are so outside, so uh, uh, with a lot of things in our hands that we forget about this inner work sometimes. 
true, ne definitely important uh, in a work on a work of facilitation. So anyone in the room would like to step in with some comments? I see Jessica uh, Brevenfield is here and she did uh, recently uh, facilitated a session for the IF uh, in a follow-up meeting on the fact week. Uh, Jessica, how about your inner work as a facilitator? I've been following a little bit all day and just hearing all the different possibilities and the power that facilitators have. I'm, I don't know, I guess I'm just overwhelmed by the, the beauty of what the work that we do and bringing all these people together and what Fernando is speaking about, more about this inner work and like what we're able to transform in people. I guess I'm, I'm kind of, I'm just super excited. I don't have a lot to contribute in, in my professional opinion. I just know it's all about adaptability and that's what I train. So this like adapt and what's our future going to look like? Hybrid, not hybrid, more inner work, training, facilitating, yeah. That's 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 really interesting. So, wh what are we bringing to the world as facilitators? Uh, this is the solstice celebration meeting, and uh, we uh, definitely need to post some message. I would really uh, kindly ask you to use Kiko Chat uh, space stage three space for your reflections. I know that there are already lots of contributions here on the chat, but uh, uh, especially John Varney, you're putting here so lovely comments. Don't forget to use also Kiko Space Stage 3 for the comments, the learning that you generate from this uh, conversation. So we have at least a memory of these wonderful, wonderful uh, sessions. And Jessica, yeah, that's totally improv, right? Okay, anyone else stepping in or should we give floor to our guest speakers that already shared so much? I would like this to be as much as participative as possible without uh, losing any of the beauty of the comments uh, raised by you on the chat. John, Varney, you would like to step in? Uh, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. The, the gulf almost between different people's presentations uh, and yet everybody's trying to talk about the same thing. So it, for me, that was, uh, that was a very interesting feature. Um, I, I was triggered to put a few things in the, in the Zoom chat there, uh, particularly picking up, I mean, I, I, I had a lot of empathy for Fernando's presentation because he seemed to be more or less where I was some years ago, or, uh, this is not not to diminish your contribution, Fernando, but to say I I empathise and sympathise with with that kind of grounding in uh, in outward bound type activities. You know the you know, the the fact that when you're engaged in something physical, you can't dispute whether it's working or not. It's kind of immediately obvious if you're lost you're lost there's no use pretending otherwise and then this point that came up there about clarity of purpose you know these these um liberating structures that you referred to uh which are all very important what are you liberating and it seems to me that from in my own experience uh i think i was always after helping people to find who they were and what was their meaning in life. Uh, so they were embedded in some organization or other. That was, that was only incidental. What, what really mattered was whether I as a facilitator or a guide or a guru or whatever I, whatever I saw myself as, whether I was really able to help people make some progress uh, and I think this is really important. You know, we, we're not there to serve the economy or I, I never saw myself as being there to serve the economy. I was there to serve humanity. And I, I don't know whether it'd be interesting to talk about this really, how you balance those two. Yeah, we've got to make a living somehow. Uh, as so as everybody else, we can help them make a living. But what's more important is helping them to make meaning, helping them to 
discover their purpose in life and what makes them fully human. Uh, and I think that as facilitators, again, uh, specifically at this time when, when we're facing existential crisis of global warming and all of that, uh, um, and, and, and the pandemic and so on, how do we help people to discover what makes life worth living? So however short it turns out to be, uh, we've done something really worthwhile with it. We've, um, it's been meaningful for us. And we do that within the context of whatever opportunities we get, facilitating some international conference or some senior team development, whatever it is, but for goodness sake, let's, let's help people make meaning. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John, for contributing. You gave us a little great purpose here because definitely if, if you bring humanity, everything else will flourish. Everything else will happen, even economic recovery. But I don't believe we can have economic recovery if we don't recover ourselves on our humankind and our humanity, definitely. I 100% with you, John. Thank you for your contribution. Martin, you have raised hand. Yeah, I'm, I'm really struck by the, the diversity and, uh, and almost eclectic mix of, of this particular discussion, but, but it's prompting me to think about two particular things that, you know, when, when we bring up our kids from the age of about six months until maybe eight or 10 years old, we actually school them, whether it's directly or indirectly, but we school them in how to interact. That's, that's just part of the natural way. <clears throat> but then I think we stop. Around eight or 10, we kind of stop. And then we get to about mid twenties when people typically go into the workforce. And then we reap the benefits or otherwise of having stopped. <laughs> because I think we as facilitators then find ourselves having to educate as much as facilitate in how to interact with each other. And, and I wonder, are we actually missing a trick? As, as professional facilitators interested in encouraging people to interact to the optimum, should, should we in some way be looking to make interventions at, in school level activity? If you look at the curriculum for any third level program, certainly any program that I've ever seen and I've seen a good few, I've never seen anything set out about conducting organization meetings, even conducting social meetings. We don't seem to do that. And, and I just wonder, are we missing an educational trick from the age of 10 to about the age of 25? Is there a gap in our our own collective development that that maybe as professional facilitators we could in some way contribute and i think it's going to john's point to say is there some way for us to bring the humanity back into our interactions and and a fight just a final observation given the year that we've had the bullhorn that social media has become everybody individually now has a great big bullhorn and I just wonder, is there some way we can switch off the bullhorn and switch on the listening faculties? Because there's a cacophony of noise out there and it's really hard to get people into the space of, if we just listen, we might hear an awful lot more. They're just my reflections on the conversation so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. So indepthful. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, my friends, I think I see now Paolo Martinez in the room, Miguel Cañas, but I would like to give floor to Elise and Fernando and then perhaps bring Paolo and Miguel Cañas also to the conversation. Elise and uh, Fernando, your stake. I, I, wanna, I wanna jump on what Martin said just real quick, if I can. Sure. Um, so a couple of things I think that are in fact happening that are an opportunity for us to help amplify is that the academic world and the, um, the university level education around meetings is in fact starting to flip. Uh, it's just, just barely starting to, to change, but um, I've been working with folks at 
University of Utah and Harvard and Stanford, all of whom of which are bringing in meeting education into their programs. Now they haven't gotten past more than a couple days on meetings, which is insane because that's how uh, leaders spend 80% of their work life is meeting and they get, you know, two days worth of training. So that's kind of nuts balls, but uh, but they are starting um, and university of there's a university in Washington that's starting to do a course on um, battle rhythms, which is basically meetings for from the military context. So so that's starting. And when we become louder and more obvious about that, that's cool. And if you see things and I think, Fernando, you I'm sure have more on this, but the, the liberating structures community exploded this last year. Right, which is about bringing um, that kind of education, not only how to do things in the small, but how to do them online out to huge groups of people. And then I think the other opportunity to help with that continued education of how to be together as humans in the workplace is exactly what Charlotte talked about, right? Because Charlotte, one of the things we see in companies that have embraced designing their meetings is that A, they've got them designed, right? So they know how to play, but then they can iterate, right? They can say, hey, that works, that didn't work. And you, you've got something to, to shift. And we find that people in those environments will do things like go home to their families and use the techniques that they learned at work about checking in with everybody, about you know asking the strategic not working questions and applying them to their personal lives. It's a liberating structure for strategy. You know about um, resolving conflict in a humane way, and they make them part of how they interact with their families, and they make them better people. So that opportunity to embed it where everybody is talking to other people every single day, and push and push and push is is ripe now in a way that it wasn't 10 years ago. Okay, cool. Interesting. Fernando? And one uh, amazing thing about liberating structures is that they are open and free and they are there for anyone, not just facilitators, but anyone can, can learn how to lead a, a liberating structure and use it because they're simple. They are made to be simple and that's the, an amazing and generous work from Keith and Henry. And that's why it exploded during the pandemic because it helps people to better interact in this virtual world. And there are many people offering free meetings, free workshops and sharing and opening. So talking about the economy that we just touched uh, a little bit behind, it's all about sharing and making a better world together. So there's no uh, fee attached to this. People are not paying for this. We are, everyone in the community has, are freely expanding this process. And it's beautiful to see how many opportunities come up with this. So you offer and things come back. So it's coming, it's, uh, it's amazing. This, I think it is a, a big shift about how we can uh, expand facilitation. And we hope, I think the, the whole community of liberated instructors, practitioners, we hope that in the future, there will be no facilitators. We will not be some the strange people who are leading the meetings. Everyone will be able to do this in a very nice way. I hope to be with my white hairs seeing this in the real world. But until then, we have work to do. Absolutely, Fernando, there's work to do. And, and let me bring into the conversation two perspectives because Miguel Cañas, which is going to be, as I told you, we're going to be featured the next year, is joined from, uh, from the morning until the, this last session. Uh, Miguel brings an approach from a different angle. Um, is is uh, now obviously considering being a member of the International Association of Facilitators, which will be very welcome, Miguel, if you join. But he approaches this from the angle of the, org uh, the organizational development, organizational change. On one hand, uh, I think it's important to hear from Miguel, and then the other end will be also Paolo Martinez next in line because Paolo is also doing incredible work at the level of uh, uh, new public purpose, right? Working with uh, regional uh, communities, regional governments in Italy. And, and, and this is a, a little bit a, a different playground, Elise, if you may, because obviously a, a, a regional government has a different kind of meeting flow needs. Uh, I would like to hear from you, Elise, on that later on. And uh, Fernando, also a little bit of liberating structures 
the use of liberating structures within the business context. And that's for Miguel Cañas. So Miguel, starting with you, uh, tell us a little bit, how do you see the future of collaboration, the future of digital collaboration uh, happening and what uh, can you bring to the world? Well, uh, you know, since we met uh, recently, uh, Paolo, um, I was not, uh, I have to do very clear in my mind the relation, the close relationship of facilitation and collaboration. You know, I'm working in the, first of all, in the collabor collaborative environments since uh, so many years with, with IBM and the, focusing much more on the tools and the, and the platforms. And, but then I realized that the, there is the, the human size, that is the human approach. Uh, that, that is the most important. And having conversations, uh, developing a structure, more structured conversations and reinforce the dialogue uh, among people. This is at the end, the most important things to keep the organizations uh, uh, alive and, and with a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, especially um, this uh, concept of collaborative intelligence. So the, the capability of people to face challenges, solve the, the problems, and uh, take decisions properly. This is at the end that uh, it's a, a human characteristic, it's a human perspective. You you have to uh, dig in, and you have to uh, at the end uh, tackle the organizations. Let, let, uh, let me just one thing because allow me. The, I would like to say a couple of things about what Fernando said about this uh, metaphor about the cube. Uh, um, it was uh, for me. Uh, it took me a little of effort to realize about the second, the second cube. I had to, to op physically open my eyes to, to, to realize about the second cube. And, and I think it's like that metaphor the, the, about the, we have to open our eyes to realize what is before us uh, in, in, in a daily basis or with organizations. Sometimes we, we are quite blind of... Uh, and we don't realize what is before us. Uh, so opening our eyes and dig uh, deeper in, in the organization, this is something that we, as a facilitators, we can help a lot in the in the uh, in the organization in a daily basis. This is something. That, and uh, let me uh, just uh, one other thing. You know, uh, service is my main approach in organizations. Is my main um, field for helping organizations uh, how to provide better services to uh, partners and to end users. But uh, since the last couple of years, you know, I shift my mind from, from uh, looking at the service from the outside in, and I'm more and more from the inside out view. So trying to um, try to re reinforce the concepts like servant leadership, trying to reinforce uh, concepts like uh, service consciousness inside organizations. I, I wonder if the facilitators can, can be in line with this uh, service approach and can you know, uh, uh, promote this uh, more service among all, all the departments, all the areas in, in organizations. Uh, it's something that uh, I wonder if we can deal with and we can you know, be in favor of uh, promoting services uh, you know, through our facilitation exercises. You know, this is something I, I especially would like to, to explore. Fantastic. To try to try to reinforce the, the service aspect of the of the, of the in your, inside organizations. I, I like this concept of the servant leadership. Uh, Paolo, do you like to comment on this? Well, I feel uh, uh, uneasy because I've been uh, sailing with my kids all day. So I, I, I dropped my mobile phone in a box uh, and said, I'm not going to look at, I only followed this morning session and now, so I have missed uh, all the beauty of the, in, I mean, I, I must say respect to you, Paul, for organizing such amazing uh, uh, sessions and uh, putting so much effort because we really need this and you are a, a master of ceremonies. Uh, amazing, amazing, I mean, really. What I can add, I also, so I missed, uh, unfortunately, the presentation. I also, like Fernando say, I want to make, be made redundant as a facilitator because I hope there will be one day where, you know, 
it's taught at schools. Uh, it's something that uh, kids uh, learn and some schools are fortunately opening to that. But I think that's where facilitation should start. I mean, university people are already formatted. Perhaps uh, there is room there as well. And I hope it becomes, as Elisa said, part of the programs. Because when, when, you, when you look at the numbers of meetings, you say, okay, what a waste of energy and human, uh, you know, you go to these meetings um, where there, there is 50 PowerPoint presentations, and, and that was in the past, and you have 100 people just listening, and you, for, for a whole day, so you say, my God, that's the equivalent of 100 person days that could be applied to shape a policy, uh, change the world, you know? And they, there they are just observing something that they could watch any time, any place, just from their mobile phone or from, you know, a video. And uh, it's, I mean, meetings in that sense are useless. So we should really kind of create a campaign, you know, uh, like nuclear power, no thanks, meetings, no thanks, something like that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, where we should work towards a certain level of meetings. And I know Lucid and the team uh, of uh, Elisa are doing a great job. So uh, also in, in the way that you are organizing all the information, uh, again, chapeau. What I can, um, just add, um, yes, uh, I, I really, I'm, I'm trying to work more on uh, uh, creating agents for policy making through the public administration and also creating in-house consultants because I, I believe that we, we need to have a real impact the organizations have to become capable of managing the process once the pro once the facilitator. So it's like being, you know, a mama or a papa who keeps the kid bicycle until they don't even notice that you are holding the seat and they are cycling their own way. So that's the way I see the future of facilitation. Thank you so much for this sharing, Paolo. Thank you so much. Okay, dear friends, I think we are going to wrap up and uh, I think uh, the conversation is, uh, the group is becoming smaller. The winter solstice is going to be celebrated or the summer solstice, depending on if you're in the north and the south. Uh, uh, last comments from any participants, please raise hands. If not, then uh, Elise and Fernando to wrap up on your takeaways from these conversations and we'll co close the meeting afterwards, uh, not without uh, opening a couple of breakouts for people to say goodbyes if they want. Elise and Fernando, I don't see any hands raised, so over to you to do the closure. Uh, takeaways from this uh, conversation. Um, well, I guess, you know, the, the thing that I would appreciate in everything that happened that even though the theme is digital collaboration and we started with a bunch of questions around technology, we're all um, reconnecting with the fact that the tech is, a, is the medium, it's not the purpose, right? And that the, the key is the key is the purpose, right? The purpose is the purpose. So I, I just love it when that comes through so clearly, regardless of our medium. Thank you so much, Elise. Fernando. Uh, first of all, thank you, Paul, for organizing this and getting amazing people together. And I think this year was a, a boost to make the work of facilitator more clear for a lot of people, because awful meetings in person, people still tolerate, but awful meetings online are really awful. So facilitators had a, a chance to show their work this year, and I hope in the next year we'll be doing more and more and expanding this profession and, and, and having people working better. Like Paolo said, we are wasting a lot of time from meetings and all this. Now it's more clear for everyone. Maybe we have this uh, leverage to, to move forward. And these kind of events help us to gather together, exchange some ideas and go back to our lives and, and do proper work. So thank you everyone. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Fernando. And uh, we couldn't close better. So I'm turning off the live stream now.